Welcome to Surrey Chapel. When I play chapel. Greed or generosity? I wonder what seeing all these buildings make you think of. Um, as you can guess, I'm not in Norwich this week. Um, I'm actually in uh, the centre of the, um, the financial district in one of the most eminent cities in the world, in the city of London. And all around me are the different banking institutions. Generally, this place would be absolutely buzzing, but because of what is going on, obviously it is pretty empty. And I wonder what it makes you think of. Do you think greed or do you think generosity? Do you know, Grace and myself spent uh, probably three, four, five years um, of our life together where we met at a church uh, just over here, a place called St. Helens Bishopsgate. And that was a place that serves people here in the city. And our experience of the bankers and the people who work around here is that of generosity. Now that probably surprises you. Uh, why is that? Well, it's because they've met the generous God who's been good to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let me share to you, with you from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, this is what we're told about Jesus. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Uh, God in his kindness has given us the Lord Jesus, who has given his life for us. He became poor, so that in Christ we might become rich, and that makes us generous. We're going to focus on the generosity of our Lord Jesus Christ, singing our first song together, Magnificent, Marvellous, Matchless Love. Magnificent, marvellous, matchless love To vast understanding to tell Forever existing in worlds above Now offered and given to all O fountain of beauty eternal The Father, the Spirit, the Son Sufficient and endlessly generous Magnificent, marvellous, matchless love Creation is brimming with thankfulness The mountains exult and they stand The seasons rejoice in your faithfulness All life is sustained by your hands You crown every meadow with colour you paint every shade in the sky Each day the dawn wakes as an encore Magnificent, marvellous, matchless love How great, how short is love What grace that you ended our brokenness You came in the fullness of time How far we had fallen from righteousness But not from the mercies of Christ Your cross is our door to redemption your death is our fullness of life That day has forgiveness flowed as a flood Magnificent, marvellous, matchless love How great, how sure His love endures forevermore Magnificent, marvellous, in your resurrection you lift us to infinite heights could anything sever or take us from magnificent marvelous matchless love how great how sure his love Marvelous, nice.
Well, in the book of Proverbs today, we're going to be thinking about generosity and actually the wise life is a life that is generous. I don't know whether you think like that. You know, maybe you think life's about hoarding and keeping everything to myself. Well, actually, no, Proverbs says being generous is the wise and the godly and the best way to live. Uh, we don't all have loads of money to be wise with, um, generous with, but we can be generous with our time and our energy and our skills and our gifts, our families. Uh, one of the things we've loved over lockdown has been watching the Getty family uh, hymn sing and they're going to teach us a new hymn. I think we might have sung it in the past but um, there are some actions they're going to teach us with this and uh, watch these kids. They love it at home. Children join in. Um, this song is about the generosity and grace of God to us in Jesus. Well, a few things to highlight for the church family. The big thing is, have you started the Billy Graham August Challenge? That is to read a chapter of Proverbs every day of the week um, during the month of 
August. It's not too late. Why don't you start it? Why don't you try it? That'd be a brilliant thing to do. Uh, patiently spend some time in it. Ask the Lord to speak to you through it. Well, remember, our church family is now going to lead us um, in prayer. Let's pray together. Shall we come to our God in prayer? Let's pray. Loving Father, we come to you in praise and adoration, acknowledging you to be the one true God, eternal, all-powerful, the very source of all that is, and the true measure of goodness, righteousness and justice. We thank you for this amazing privilege of being able to come to you in prayer as we come in the name of Jesus, and we delight to know that you hear our prayers and always answer them according to your perfect wisdom. Forgive us, we pray, if we feel disappointed when your solutions to the challenges we bring to you don't match our own wishes. And help us to remember that in your perfect sovereignty, you know the end from the beginning, whereas we can only ever see just a tiny piece of the tapestry of history. We also thank you for the beauty and for the wonder of your creation. And yet we're also acutely aware that all isn't well, that we live in a, in a world that's broken, a world that's tainted by evil, by sin, including our own, because every one of us falls short of your perfect standard, and we deserve, we deserve to be judged accordingly. So above all, we thank you for sending Jesus into this world to rescue us from that dreadful judgment that we deserve, as he took every bit of our sin on himself, when he went to the cross. Thank you that he's fully paid the penalty of eternal separation from yourself on behalf of all who believe, and then took up his life again to show his power over even death itself and to demonstrate that we too, we can look forward to new life with him in heaven. O oh, Father, in, in sending Jesus, you've shown generosity, generosity beyond anything that we might imagine or expect. So besides being eternally grateful for our salvation, we pray that we might ourselves be generous and may our generosity and way of life as serve as bright beacons in this broken world for your glory and for the building of your kingdom. And now, loving Father, we would particularly pray for national leaders across the world as they continue to seek ways forward through the present pandemic. May they know true wisdom so that the widespread suffering, bereavement and heartache is minimised and the threatened second wave avoided. We also continue to pray for those working in health services across the globe, that you will protect them as they continue to do their very best to help others and for success for the scientists as they seek a vaccine which will help to protect us all. We pray too for wisdom among church leaders as they seek to safely reopen the churches and as they evaluate what's been learned through the closed period so that we might move into the new normal in the very best possible way. And finally, Father, we bring to you the individuals known to us with particular and perhaps urgent needs. There are those in our church who are recently bereaved while others struggle with challenges themselves or for loved ones around mental or physical well-being, employment, loneliness, finance, a whole raft of reasons and issues. You know each one by name, Father, and the situation in which they find themselves. And we ask that they will know hope through your love, peace and closeness and have a very special awareness of your power over all creation not least the COVID-19 virus. Oh, loving Father, we bring all these prayers to you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Greatest day in history. Death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. 
Life eternal, you have won the day. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. And oh, happy day, happy day. You washed my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. When I stand in that place, free at last, meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. Endless joy, perfect peace, earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. What a glorious way that you have saved me, and oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious day that you This morning we are reading from the book of Proverbs, chapter 11, verses 24 to 28. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. People curse the one who hoards grain, but they pray blessings on the one who is willing to sell. Whoever seeks good finds favour, but evil comes to one who searches for it. Those who trust in their riches will fall but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. As I say, if you want to learn to do something really well, then it's always good to learn from the very best. Uh, today we're thinking about the subject of generosity, and to do that we're once again going to be looking at the book of Proverbs uh, the man who wrote Proverbs, as we know, was King Solomon, and he was a very wealthy and yet a very generous individual. Uh, and he's here trying to teach his, his young son, the prince, all about this important trait in life. And you know, I'm sure that it was actually a bit of a, a, bit of a family trait. In fact, I'm sure that King Solomon learned to be generous from his very own father, King David. 
If you have a, a look at the book of First uh, Chronicles, chapter 29, at some point, you'll be able to see just how generous King David was, as he donated vast stores of his own silver and gold, which would have been Solomon's inheritance, to the rebuilding of the temple. And that would have been hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds in today's currency, uh, which then set off a chain reaction amongst the people who then gave of, of their own talents and time and treasure to the rebuilding. So turn with me, if you have a Bible, to, to Proverbs chapter 11. Uh, we found ourselves moving about in the book of Proverbs last week, but we're going to bed ourselves down in this particular uh, chapter this week as we look at this subject of generosity. Now, we've already had read to us verses 24 to 28 a moment ago. But what is the maxim? Uh, what is the overarching uh, truth here? Uh, what is the main point that these, these verses are trying to, to make and get across to us? Well, if we were to sum it up, we might say that God's word is telling us to, to be generous and not stingy. To be generous and not selfish. Why do, do we need to be reminded of that? Well, it's because as human beings, uh, we are naturally selfish people, aren't we? We, we all want what we want. Uh, in fact, we were born that way. When you think about it, one of the very first words that, that a child uh, says is that word mine, isn't it? Uh, perhaps you've uh, just sat down as a parent to watch the TV and suddenly you, you hear that that phrase coming from the depths of another room, don't you? Mine, mine, mine. And so as a parent, you know what your responsibility is. You need to get up off of your uh, sofa and uh, go and search for where this sound is actually coming from. And when you open the door to the room, uh, you see there, uh, usually a younger child, uh, trying to pull something off of an older child and shouting those words, mine, mine, mine. Now, let me explain that as a parent, there does come a moment in our lives, doesn't there, when we just appreciate a bit of peace and quiet. And so justice, it kind of goes out of the window at that point. And so we, we say to the older child, just give it to her. But that is my... Just give it to her. She's got stuff that's mine too. Just, just give it to her. Isn't that true? The fact is that we were born selfish, and yet, with Christ's help... We are born again to be generous. And that's what Proverbs is getting at when it says things like, uh, verse 24, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. And again, in verse 25, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Now, we might think with our human thinking and our, our human logic that that's kind of backwards. I mean, surely the one with the most toys wins, don't they? That's what this world teaches us to think, isn't it? Accumulate all you can and you will be happy, it tells us. Don't give it, get it. Get all you can, fill your boots. Uh, this life isn't going to last very long. Do that as long as you can and, and, and try and accumulate everything you can. Why do, we, why do we live like that? Well, it's because having stuff ourselves, it, it kind of makes us feel a little bit safe and secure, doesn't it? Whereas giving stuff away, well, it makes us feel a little bit vulnerable. And yet the Bible tells us here that it's actually better to, to let go than to keep hold of things. In fact, it goes even further than that. In these verses, uh, we read that it, it's, it's good to give stuff away. And doing that will actually make us even richer, even more prosperous, uh, these verses tell us. Maybe not physically and financially in the here and now. We're not talking prosperity gospel this morning, but certainly in the life to come. And yet, when you think about it, we do actually benefit in the here and now, don't we, from, from giving and, uh, and, and being generous. In a very real sense, we will prosper now, as we said, not necessarily materially and, and physically and financially, but, but we will benefit relationally and emotionally and spiritually. We all know what it's like to, to give, don't we? As kids, when, when Christmas rolled around, it was all about us, wasn't it, and the presents we were getting, and yet, as we've grown older... It's not about us anymore, is it? It's, it's often about 
uh, giving rather than getting. It's more blessed to give than received, as the Bible tells us. God wants us all to grow up and to become mature, to be generous, to become givers and not just takers. And yet, once again, that's very hard to do for us, isn't it? Because it goes against the grain of our old human nature. Uh, Just look at verse 26. We read there, people curse those who haul grain, but they pray God's blessing on those who are willing to sell. And we've all experienced a very recent uh, example of this particular proverb. But in our case, it wasn't grain that was being hauled, it was it? No, it was something very different. It was actually toilet rolls, wasn't it? Can you remember the panic buying that began at the end of March when the pandemic uh, started as, as, as supermarket shelves were stripped bare? Why toilet, toilet rolls when, well, it doesn't really have anything to do with a respiratory virus, does it? Well, people uh, began to stock up on this essential item because, well, it is kind of essential if you're going to be in lockdown for any period of time, isn't it? But there were also a few who saw this opportunity to to make some money. Just like the guy in this particular proverb did. He began hoarding grain to to begin to affect the supply and demand economics, to drive up the price. Which is exactly what happened on eBay recently, uh, where I saw that one toilet roll was reportedly selling for £1,000. £1,000. Can you believe it? Well, it was a, an Asda own brand, so maybe that explains it, I don't know. But what was people's reaction to this kind of hoarding and driving up of the price? Well, it was actually one of outrage, wasn't it? The public were furious and they took to, to social media to, to vent their frustrations. Just as they did in this particular proverb. We're told there, aren't we, that, uh, that uh, they, they will curse those who hoard grain. But once again, it's, it's just another example to us, isn't it, of our own uh, selfishness. Hoarding and driving up the price, price to make ourselves rich. It's a selfish thing to do. But God's economy, God's economy works very much differently. He calls us to, to be generous and not stingy, to be outward focused, not inward looking, to, to think of others better than ourselves. So if that's the maxim, if that's how God wants us to live, then how can we be more generous? What are the methods uh, we need to to use to do this? Well, in verse 24, it does tell us, doesn't it, to to give freely. Uh, What does that look like? Well, this morning we're just going to have a look at a few New Testament verses to help us think of, of ways that we can be generous to others. First of all, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, We read these words. We can be generous specifically. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. If we're wondering how we can be generous, where we can put our our time and our effort and our energy, then this verse gives us the answer, doesn't it? That as Christians, we are to do good to all, but especially, specifically, to those who belong to the family of believers. In other words, those in the church, those fellow followers of Christ. This is the first place that should receive our generosity when it comes to our time and our talents and our treasure. And I'm not saying that this morning because our coffers are empty, or because anyone wants a pay rise. No, as a church, you are already incredibly generous. Just ask the the guys down at Tear Fund headquarters, and they will testify to that. Uh, We are one of their biggest donors. And that's not just in uh, terms of uh, money. That's also in terms of um, time that people give to run these events that, that fundraise and raise awareness for them. Just ask the many pastors and missionaries that as a church we've equipped over the years and sent out. And they will tell you how generous Surrey Chapel has been to them. In fact, one guy recently told me that his college that he'd been studying for three years, a Bible college, couldn't quite believe that the individuals in the church had had paid all of his tuition fees. Because that just doesn't happen, they said. 
Just ask the many CAP clients which the team sees and, and takes the time to help either find a job or navigate their way out of debt. And you will hear stories of how generous they, they are. Now, I'm not saying this this morning to caress anyone's ego or to make us think, hang on a minute, we've done what we can. Uh, let's put our feet up and sit back. No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to encourage us to, to be generous all the more so to press on and continue in that vein. To give generously to the work of the church. Knowing that as well as being edified and built up spiritually ourselves, we are also investing in other people and helping and enabling them to hear the good news of the gospel message of Christ. So we are to give specifically. But giving freely, as Proverbs uh, chapter eleven twenty four puts it, can also mean giving uh, spontaneously. Over in Acts chapter 4 and verse 34, we read these words. We read that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or, sold, uh, or, or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. And then we're given a specific example. We're told Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Don't you just love that? That Barnabas and, and others like him, there in that particular church, wealthy landowners, they saw a need and they thought to themselves, you know what? We've got the means to be able to help. Uh, this in this situation and so off they went and sold a field or a house and they pulled the money together so that everyone was taken care of so that no one amongst them had needs well, that's spontaneous giving isn't it I can remember when I first uh, started out in ministry uh, I was just uh, out of bible school and I worked for a local church here in the city as a youth worker and I drove around in a Fiat Uno at the time uh, that was until it caught fire one day. Uh, my twin sister, she'd uh, dropped me off at the train station and it was her first time driving it back on her own. And, and my last words to her as she left were these, please don't crash it. Well, you know what? She kept her word. She didn't crash it. Unfortunately, as she was driving home, almost back, a couple of guys flagged her down on the roadside because there were flames leaping out from underneath the car. Well, let's just say that the fire brigade, they took care of the rest as they hammered their way through the bonnet to get to the fire and put it out. We know hearing about this and hearing that I no longer had any car, a car anymore, the next Sunday, one particular man in the church, he walked up to me and he said to me, Gary, I want you to give you my car. And I was quite taken aback by that. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, well, I've got a motorbike that I use. I've, I've not got any family at the moment. And, and so I... I want to, to give you my car. You haven't got one. And you know, it wasn't an old banger. It was actually quite a nice car. It was a Rover 216 GTI with leather seats. It was a great car. And yet it was also very, very generous of him to do that. It was an, uh, an example of spontaneous giving. And then thirdly, not only can our uh, giving be done specifically, and spontaneously but it can also be done uh, secretly if you turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verses 3 and 4 you read these words we're told there but when you give to the needy do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you now, that's great isn't it because when we give in secret, the only person who's getting the praise and the glory is God himself, isn't it? You know how it is, perhaps you've been out for the day and you arrive home to find on your doorstep some flowers or some cookies that someone has made for you. And you think, wow, who's given me this? There's no name or address with it. Or maybe someone uh, perhaps leaves some foreign currency on your desk at work. That you're going on holiday the next week and they give this gift to you and yet you don't know who it is it's done completely anonymously and you don't know who to thank in that situation well what are you forced to do well the only one left to thank is god himself isn't it and we pray don't we thank you lord for for being so generous thank you for giving me this gift for whoever uh, you cause to to give it 
So we can give secretly as well. And then lastly, the final method of giving is that of sacrificial giving. We can give sacrificially. Uh, we read earlier in Proverbs 11, verse 28, of a selfish guy who hoarded grain to, to drive up the price and make more money. He was a guy who was out for himself, only interested in number one. But in the book of 2 Corinthians, and chapter 8, uh, we read these words. It's a church in Macedonia. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. It was God's grace working through them. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they went beyond our expectations. Having given themselves first of all to the Lord, they gave themselves by the will of God also to us. This group of churches, at the time, they were undergoing some severe challenges and trials. They were under persecution from local authorities as well as their own neighbours who were making their lives extremely difficult because of their newfound faith in Jesus Christ. They had been financially disadvantaged and overlooked and, and held back in many different ways. And yet, as we read here, they were still overflowing with joy. And what's more, they were begging to be involved. How can we give? What can we do? We just want to be involved in, in what God is doing, the Macedonian churches were saying. And then, you know, I've met plenty of people who had offered to help over the years, but I've never met anyone who has begged me to be involved in some uh, kind of uh, work in quite the way that these Christians were. And they were doing that even though they themselves were in great need. They gave sacrificially, we're told. Now let me just say at this point that, that reading those words isn't meant to, to crush us. It's actually meant to inspire us. I realise that there may well be some who are listening to this and uh, perhaps at the moment you are weighed down by debt or perhaps by the circumstances and other responsibilities in your life. Well, let me just go back to the, the book of Proverbs and chapter 11 and verse 24, if that is you this morning. Let's just read the, that verse again. It says, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, and that's a very important word in that verse, unduly, but comes to poverty. You see, we're not talking about giving away so much that we ourselves are, are left destitute or we're completely run into the ground because uh, we're, we're just overworked with everything that we're trying to do. No, we need to take care of ourselves. And yet the Bible does call us to be generous in those ways that we can be, with our time, with our talent and with our treasure. Just like that widow who had that, that small mite and, and just put it in the treasury. She gave what she could. She gave what she could. Why? What's the motive? Well, let's just finish with this. You see, there are plenty of people around us who are extremely generous, aren't there? And yet they don't follow the Lord. Some are, sometimes, very often, these people are even more generous than some stingy Christians, which probably should shame us really as Christians because this should be a character trait within us. We should be marked out by our generosity. That is, should be one of the, the defining features of a believer's life. So what is it that makes us distinct as a generous people? Well, it's actually the motive behind our generosity. We should be generous as Christians because our Lord has been generous to us. So our motivation, unlike those in the world, doesn't come from a guilty conscience. It's not because we're trying to earn favour with God or with those around us. It's not like we're trying to validate ourselves in any kind of way. Our motivation for being generous as Christians stems from the fact that we have experienced God's goodness and his grace toward us in Christ. He has lavished grace upon grace 
into our lives and then that should flow out of us to others. We know that what Jesus did in dying on the cross, in dying there so that we could have our sins forgiven, we know that that is something that we could never ever repay. He has lavished uh, grace upon grace in our lives. And it's as we recognise just how generous God has been to us in saving us that our own generosity should flow. But you know, that's not the only reason that we should be generous. Because not only are we the recipients of God's saving grace, we are also the recipients of God's common grace too. As we look around us and as we see everything, we, we see that it's actually all God's in the first place. Everything there is. The jobs we do, the talents we have, the, the mind and intellect that he's given us, the money we earn. It's all God's. It's all his in the first place. He owns everything. We are simply stewards of it. We are stewards of all that God has given us. The fact is that we'd earn nothing and we'd own nothing if he hadn't entrusted it to us in the first place. It's all his stuff. And realising that should motivate us to be generous. Understanding that kind of changes our perspective on life, doesn't it? We are called to be stewards and not hoarders, to be givers and not takers, to be generous and not stingy or selfish. Proverbs 11 verse 28 says this, Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. So let's live not for this life, but with eternity in view with God at the very centre of our lives, recognising just who he is, our perfect king, and what he has given us. Let's live generously so that he might be praised, so that people might look at our lives and praise our Father in heaven. Let's just pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you and praise you that you have blessed us in so many ways, materially, physically, spiritually, intellectually lord we realize that everything we have comes from you that we wouldn't have any of it if you hadn't first given it to us and so we ask lord that you would help us to be generous with these things that we would be good stewards of all that you have given us that we would seek to help others and further the work of your kingdom with our gifts with our time with our talents and with our treasures lord help us to do that we pray that people might look to you and praise you because of the generosity uh, of those uh, of us your children we ask this in jesus name amen well we're now going to finish with a song i will offer up my life let's sing this together What can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? Savior, what can be said? What can be sung as a praise of your name for the things you have done? All my words could not tell.
It's been great having you with us um, this week at Surrey Chapel. Again, our service will be out next week, same time, nine o'clock. We would love to have you join us there. And uh, again, if you want to keep up to date with what's going on, please hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel and you'll be kept up to date with the latest videos that are put out. There's constant stuff being put out. And also, um, if you want to um, subscribe to Church Matters, it's our weekly church email, then go on our church website email the office and they can add you to that list so you can keep up to date with what is going on uh, here's some words from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 to finish our time with again for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich let's live this week in the light of Christ's generosity to us have a good week